I found the undocumented Americans darkly funny, seething with rage and wit in equal parts. I think it's also a book that's full of care and compassion. It made me laugh and cry in one sitting. Um, it's a deeply compelling chronicle of the widely differing and various lives of people who are undocumented and explores the daily violences that are endured, in some cases overcome and in some cases not, at the hands of the state through a punitive and racist border regime. And what I love most about the book was Carla's rejection of the very kind of typical colonial lens of journalism, which generally looks at its subjects through a microscope and talks about how fascinating they are because they're so different and their lives are so extreme and unrelatable. But Carla really dismantles that false separation, um, acknowledging her positionality in the center of the story and recognizing the moments when she's pulled into and out of the narrative. And I think in doing so brings together not an anthropological research report, but a shared testimony of struggle with a beating heart of solidarity and resistance and a testimony that says, if nothing else, that we are here and we exist. And I'm so pleased to be talking with Carla today about her book. And I'd like to begin by inviting her to share with us a reading from the undocumented Americans to kick us off. So over to you, Carla. Thanks, Leah. Um, I'm really honored that you're um, in conversation with me today. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll read from the introduction. I don't usually do readings during my events because when I'm in the audience, I tend to, but um, I think the introduction gives you a good taste of the book. On the night of the 2016 presidential election, I spent a long time deciding what to wear. I'd be staying home to watch the returns with my partner, but the Comey letter had come out in mid-October and I was convinced Trump was going to win. I'd always admired the women on the Titanic who reportedly drowned wearing their finest clothing and furs and jewels and the violinist who kept playing even as the ship sank. I wore a burgundy velvet dress with sheer lace back paneling, a ribbon in my hair, red lipstick, and a leopard print faux fur coat over my shoulders. I poured myself a goblet of wine. I understood that night would be my end, but I would not be ushered to an internment camp in sweatpants. The returns hadn't finished coming in when my father, who was undocumented, called me to tell me it was the end times. I threw myself into bed without washing off my makeup, without, brush, without brushing my teeth. I had a 4 a.m. wake up call. A few hours later, I took a bunch of trains to New Jersey to meet an oceanographer I was profiling for a New York magazine. We took a boat to the Hudson and sped by the feet of the Statue of Liberty. Fuck, I said, this will appear sentimental. Still, I asked him to take my picture in front of it and I smiled at the camera the strong winds blowing hair in my face. It seemed safe somehow to be here at the lady, at, to be there at Lady Liberty's feet. I got off the boat and on my phone, emailed an agent I'd been friendly with since I was a kid and I was and told him I was ready to write the book. And he said, okay. When I was a senior at Harvard, I wrote an anonymous essay for the Daily Beast about what they wanted to call my dirty little secret, that I wasn't documented. It got me some attention. It was a different time and agents wrote asking if I wanted to write a memoir. A news program asked to film me when I fucking packed up my dorm to show I guess that I was leaving Harvard without any plans, without even the promise of a career. This was before DACA. I was angry. A memoir? I was 21. I wasn't, Bar I wasn't fucking Barbara Streisand. I'd been writing professionally since I was 15, but only about, a mu only about music. I wanted to be the guy in high fidelity and I didn't want my first book to be a rueful tale about being a sickly Victorian orphan with tuberculosis. We didn't have a social security number, which is what the agents all wanted. The guy who eventually ended up becoming my agent respected that. I would write, um, that morning I received a bunch of emails from people who are really freaked out about Trump winning and the emails were essentially offers to hide me in their second houses in Vermont or the woods somewhere or stay in their basements. Shit, I told my partner, they're trying to Anne Frank me. Um, by this point, I've been pursuing a PhD at Yale because I needed the health insurance and had read lots of books about migrants and hated a lot of them because I couldn't see my family in them, because I saw my parents as more than laborers, as more than sufferers or dreamers. I thought I could write something better, something that rang true, 
and I thought I was the best person to do it. I was just crazy enough because if you're going to write a book about undocumented immigrants in America, the story, the full story, you have to be a little bit crazy and you certainly can't be enamored by America. Not still. That disqualifies you. I think that's a good natural ending. Great. Thank you so much, Carla. Um, I love the introduction to your book. I think it kind of gives such a good taste and, and flavor of your writing and how kind of engaging it is. Um, in the introduction, you also write about um, journalism as drag and you write when you are an undocumented immigrant with undocumented family writing about undocumented immigrants, it feels unethical to put on the drag of a journalist. And later you also write, I am not a journalist. Journalists, to the best of my knowledge, do not try to change the outcome of their stories. And I really related to this because I used to write for a magazine myself and also kind of resist the mantle of journalist um, as so much of my writing was about trying to change outcomes, whether it's, you know, raising awareness of different topics or campaigns, um, if people are facing deportation or workers going on strike. And so when you say in the book that you're not a journalist, I understand you to be talking about the way that people with papers, white people, people who aren't from migrant communities who write on these topics of race and migration often write with this very anthropological lens, whereas you, as you say in the book, you're writing from a place of shared memories and shared trauma. Um, can you kind of talk a bit about the strength and solidarity, but also perhaps the challenges that come from writing on a topic that you're you know, very much at the center of, not removed from, but directly experiencing as you write? That's a good question. Um, I don't know how you relate to this, but uh, at the beginning, I mean, I, I could only really take that approach in writing this first book um, because um, I think that some of the relationships I was able to cultivate and um, the approaches that I took were kind of a uh, were kind of good for just like one time only. Mm -hmm. um, I was completely not boundaried with the subjects, and um, some people um, I formed really close relationships with, and took on their pain as my pain, and it allowed me incredible access into their lives and. Um, I completely allowed my own traumas and my own relationships that were falling apart with my family or with this country or with myself to um, inform the way I, I wrote about a collective. And um, that, you know, lack of separation between self and subject and between life and work is not something that's sustainable. And that is something that I think journalists who are experienced know. Um, and journalists who are from the communities that they, co that, that they cover, something that they have to work on. And I sort of hadn't put a lot of thought into that. Um, and it, it is something that I had to do, you know, and it is something that I'm proud that I did, but that I only could do once. Um, if, you know, I'm writing about immigrants now um, for publications um, that are, it's not, you know, creative nonfiction. It is journalism and it's reporting. Um, and I am allowed to write in the first person and use my voice, just you no know, magical realism. Um, and the ways that I am thinking about it now are, you know, how do I also create familiarity and trust and access um, while still maintaining some kind of boundary around myself where I don't, um, and I think it's, I think it's, uh, I think that's an interesting question. And I think it's a question that everybody who has, you know, skin in the game um, grapples with. It's not just me. Um, I, um, there are some things that I'd like to do that I can't do based on the publications I write for, like change names or change identifying details. Every publication has its house rules. Mm. And person who was undocumented and who has undocumented family, I want to be extra protective. I want to, you know, I want, I want nothing to leak. I want to protect them as much as I can. Um, and there's some things that I can do in my personal, in my own books 
that I can't do for publications. But in terms of the ethics, the representational ethics that I can bring to the publications, mm -hmm. which is exactly as you say, to steer away from a gaze, which is um, here, I don't know if it's common to say in the UK, but here um, migrants are all, all <laughs> one, they're called undocumented workers, um, and two, they're said to be in the shadows. Um, and so those are two things that I actively write against. Hmm. Yeah, I think I think your book is so powerful and it's very kind of un unapologetic um, annihilation of those very tired and flattened stereotypes of undocumented people, um, which is this kind of broad sweeping category containing like such a multitude of lives and experiences, right? It's not this kind of monolithic experience, of course. Um, and I really appreciated how the breadth of your interviews and your attention to detail represents people with all of their kind of quirks and foibles and their hopes and dreams and disappointments. What do you think the impact has been of for so long such narrow depictions of undocumented people in media and art and, and everywhere? And, and why was it so important for you to kind of push back against that and, and reshape that narrative in your own way? I mean, I think everybody knows the like, you know, the story of like growing up, you know, certain, there are those of us who don't see us represented in the media. Um, and, you know, the story goes that we like, we're like upset because we don't have Barbies that look like us. I think the story is like more like when we move in in circles that are you know of people that don't look like us and don't act like us and don't come from our communities they treat us like we're the strangest most magical thing on earth and they're like like how could you possibly exist you know i didn't i i played with white barbies i didn't care <laughs> you know, there was a there was a there was a brown skin Barbie. Her name was Teresa. I didn't care oh, for Teresa. I remember Teresa. <laughs> I didn't care for Teresa. <laughs> Teresa was boring. She had boring clothes. But you know, when I moved around in circles of American citizens, um, largely white, but not always white, they were like, "How could you possibly have come from this world of poverty and undocumented immigrants?" And you like. You know you're funny like you 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 have a dark humor like you joke about calling ice on your own father like how could you how could you both be scared of your father being deported but also make jokes with your brother about it how could that exist and i'd be like well i grew up watching SN saturday night live and you know i think that all white people are jewish comedians because <laughs> I grew up watching on television and they were like how could you exist so that is what <laughs> the lack of representation felt like to me um it was that in the world people believed the caricatures and so when they met people who didn't weren't caricatures they really bent us to fit the caricatures so that if I ever got angry or if I ever cried or if I um, wore something slutty, it was like, ah, there it is, there mm -hmm. it is, I knew it. That was the, that's the caricature. And the parts of me that didn't fit were seen as just being like magical parts of me. Um, and so what I did here was like, I simply wrote what I saw. You know, I simply wrote what was interesting to me about people. Um, and, and the people that I met, you know, I was like, this lady seems to not like being a mom, you know? And I can relate to that. Um, and I'm like, this lady seems to have mental health issues, but in addition to that, seems to be crazy, you know? And I would write that. And I think because I wasn't working off of a, a, a script or off of a blueprint, people are like, she's humanizing them. And it's like, well, if you're not working off of any any assumptions, um, you're just writing what you see, right? Mm. Mm. And I guess that's 
yeah the most kind of normal thing and like to us perhaps like not revolutionary particularly right you're just kind of meeting a person and you're telling their story and it's it's um it's noteworthy that that is remarkable to just kind of tell the story of an everyday person and yeah with all of their their quirks and different attributes um i think part of why i find your book so refreshing is the way that you do transcend those very typical boundaries of the form you're a researcher but you're also someone you know living at the sites of different intersecting oppressions you're an experienced and seasoned writer but you're also very clear about your own positionality within the work and there's a line that really struck me towards the end of the book where you write I'm looking to interview children of immigrants partly to get a blueprint for myself because I'm lost and I'm scared and it really struck me because it's so frank like I can't remember reading a book where the author is just so upfront about what it is that brings them to the page there's no kind of imposter syndrome or posturing you're not trying to persuade anybody about why they should pay attention to what you're writing and I I find that very inspiring can you kind of talk a bit about that frankness do you I mean do you recognize that in your writing and is is there something that kind of compels you to write in that way yes I have a greater understanding of that now at the beginning I would say um people would ask me about like why I don't I guess why I don't like write stereo in stereotypes why I don't engage in stereotypes and I used to say that like I'm not really an ideas writer you know um someone in my imprint is Ta-Nehisi Coates and I look up to him a lot and um I think of him as the big brother who does not know I exist and he's an <laughs> ideas writer um he's a fantastic writer but he also has fantastic ideas I think of myself as someone who is good on the sentence level but is also good at taking things that are cliches and that are around, you know, in circulation, cliches that are in circulation and like breathing life into them where you can understand what they, what they really are. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I don't think it's possible for me to be um, dishonest in the writing and I, and, and it is a great strength, but um, over the past year, um, I've, uh, through conversations with my partner and my psychiatrist, um, I've learned that I'm on the autism spectrum and um, I've become so much more aware of uh, some of the writing that is informed by that and is informed by the way that my brain works and the way that I view the world. And I find it um, important to tell people how I'm feeling and um, why I'm feeling what I'm feeling um, and to sort of describe my primary emotion and my secondary emotion. That might not be everyone's experience, but um, it is the way that I engage with people in real life. Um, and uh, some, something that I you know, have is, is um, if I'm you know, angry about something, I, I know that I, I express anger because I'm actually sad about something. And then I'm probably sad because I I feel like I'm gonna be abandoned or I feel like I'm, like you don't love me. Like those are my great fears. Mm. And so I will express that to somebody. And um, people are not really used to being spoken up to that way where I'm like, I'm really, I'm angry at you, but I'm actually um, sad. And the reason I'm sad is because I think you don't love me. And people are like, I'm, I'm your friend and I just snapped at you, you know? And in my writing, I find it important to be like, I'm in Flint and I am really upset right now. And I could say I'm upset about capitalism, but really I know I'm upset because I want to tell all of these young people to go to college. Mm. I think that will save them, but I know it won't save them. And I know I'm supposed to believe that college is not for everyone, but I don't know what else to tell them. And, and it's truly what I feel. And I think that acknowledging the complexity of an emotion and also what an emotion is masking um, is really important for those of us in communities where, where there are secrets and where also 
there's like autistic masking for girls and women where you have to sort of appear neurotypical in order to make it in the world. And I think for those of us who come from communities of color, you, you there's, there's another kind of masking. Um, and a lot of it is with um, our emotions. And so I think what a lot of people related to in the book is how I, how I spoke about those emotions that are sometimes really deep, deep down inside. Um, I don't think I can hide them, um, but I also think that I make them accessible to people in a way that makes it less scary. Mm. I definitely felt that reading the book, you kind of, there's a sense of giving permission um, for the person who's reading it to acknowledge that I mean, if, if you're somebody who can kind of relate di directly to the experiences that you've shared in the book um, and the people that you've spoken to, to acknowledge the kind of profound impact that it will have on you and, and the emotions that arise from that, I found that very powerful. Um, you mentioned kind of not or not considering yourself an ideas writer, but I think in your book, which I think could be described as creative nonfiction, you write about fiction as a means of reclaiming the dead and there were so many beautiful moments where you explore um, kind of possible narratives or realities for people that you meet or hear about um, for example there's a moment where you imagine the scene of a man who drowns in a basement during hurricane sandy can you talk a bit more about the the power and importance of fiction as a, a reclamation for communities whose narratives are so often kind of pushed I won't say it to the shadows, to the margins, and whose stories, um, lives, and deaths, and all their nuance are so commonly whitewashed from history. Yeah, I, I, I thought that scene was important because, um, well, I mean, the answer is I think I think that there, are, as a writer. Um, my way of resisting is is to is to write the tool, the only tool that I have at my disposal is to write, and I didn't think the way that um, that the man I described the way the the way he died was fair. I didn't think that it was fair. I think it could have happened to to any of us. I think it could have happened to me. Um, and I um, one of the things that that really haunts me is. Um, you know the idea of an unmarked grave, the idea of an, someone who doesn't have a burial or um, or a grave site, and this man drowns during a hurricane in a basement where he's squatting because he's succumbed to alcoholism and he drowns because he's probably drunk during a um, bad moment in a hurricane. And I thought that's that's not how he should go and the the people that he knew were really embarrassed by the fact that that's how he died because it seemed like it it reflected on them because there had been so much propaganda against them day laborers day um day workers and um so i thought that it was a an opportunity for me to resist using the tools that i had um um i know this is not the way that it's meant to be interpreted but i've always thought about how you can't use the master's tools to dismantle. Um, I, I've always been like, I have English um, and I have the ability to write and I have, I'm quite well read. Um, and I think using the master's tools sometimes works. Um, and so I, I, I thought that I would just write a different ending. Um, I alert the reader, um, but it doesn't make it any less powerful. And then I, I, I believe that the reader has an emotional experience and I'm saying, look how true this is too. Um, and I think that, um, I think that that is a, a way of um, reclaiming a narrative um, where I'm asking the reader to interrogate what stories we receive from people who feed us those stories um, to question the source of those stories. Um, and it also just felt like, you know, giving that man a, uh, a burial. Mm, a burial of sorts kind of within the text of the book. Yeah. 
Um, I just want to remind people at this juncture to kind of put your questions in the chat um, in maybe five or ten minutes. We're going to have a bit of time um, where I will put your questions to Carla. So please do share those with us. Um, otherwise, I'm going to keep plowing on with mine. So if you want to interrupt that flow, then put some questions in. Um, I want to speak a little bit about um, the people in your book kind of work in, in lots of different professions and you make it very clear that you're resistant to that euphemistic framing of undocumented people as, you know, merely workers, as if, you know, that the act of working is where humans get their worth. Um, and we see this narrative a lot in the UK, migrants rights movement, this kind of migrants contribute narrative, which tries to persuade um, essentially racists that migrants and people of colour should be allowed to be here because we're working and we're contributing to the economy and therefore, you know, that's what is, that's our ticket in. Um, and in my own book, I argue that people of colour and migrant communities actually have a right to access the resources and opportunities that were hoarded in this country through colonialism. And I find this whole kind of migrant, migrants contribute narrative not actually helpful in the broader struggle to just have our humanity recognized. How do you see this um, kind of playing out in the US context at the moment? Is there this continued idea that people need to work and be um, you know, productive economic units in order to prove their right to be there? I do. Um, I do. I think that um, I think it's 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 a, it's um I think it's something the the U.S. just generally uh, just does. I mean, not just to migrants, but also the way that it thinks of disabled people um, and the way that it um, thinks about. Um, you know, quote, minority populations in terms of their economic output um, and their, you know, ability to, you know, the, the way they calculate social capital. Um, it's something that I've thought about a lot. Um, um, you know, one is, right, of course, that, you know, when, when they talk about immigration reform, one of the big things that they talk about is, how much we contribute to the economy. When they talk about like young immigrants, you know, young immigrants, they talk about um, all of the uh, the professions as like doctors, lawyers, teachers, where they're you know in these really respectable jobs. Although you know most of them are in, most most are in service jobs, which are the backbone of the economy. But if you talk about that, then it gets into conversations like necessarily about why the backbone of our economy is built on like black and brown people working service jobs and why we don't raise the minimum wage. So we don't want to look at that. So we talk about the ones that are doctors and lawyers and like, let's not talk about teachers too much because then we talk about why we're not supporting teachers. And um, so the focus just gets, just it's, it's such a romantic portrait of, um, migrant contributions. And I always just feel crazy when we talk about that because it, I'm like, you want, you're, you're saying that you want to keep us here and you're the good guys, but you're saying you want to keep us here because there's a lot of us and then, and we, they, you know, we my like my dad, like they work really hard for very little pay and you don't have to pay them benefits and that you know you can threaten to fire them if they ask for for a day off so you want to keep them here because you're saying that you're saying that that that's what you like and so why is that a selling point that should feel good to me like you're saying there it's it's implied that that it's um it's it's a selling point for people who are not on my side so, um, so I've never liked that when that talking point has come from, from other immigrants. I sort of feel like if that is a talking point that is to be made, it is, it is to be made by people that I can look at and be like, well, that's a bummer. I don't want to be talked about that way. Mm -hmm. But if it's people who are immigrants and they're talking about that way about their parents, 
you know, I don't like that. It doesn't feel good to me. Um, yeah, and um, and I feel like just in ways of people, just it's so dehumanizing to hear people trying to be nice and calling someone an undocumented worker. Mm. It makes me think of a donkey. It makes yeah. me, makes me think that people are trying to refer to us, but they're just thinking of us as donkeys who can just carry a lot on our backs. Um, it just doesn't. It just. It's. I don't like it. Mm. It's very kind of flattening and two dimensional to kind of just the main thing about a person to be about the potentially incredibly exploitative labor that they're they're, they're carrying out. You know, I like undocumented immigrant is fine. Like the word immigrant isn't. I think people think that the word immigrant might be offensive. Like I'll never forget. This was the first time that this was planted in my head. I don't watch The Office. I think um at least in America, the American office, I mean, my respects, but like in America, the American office, um, liking it is a little bit normy and, um, and like boring people watch it. Okay. Um, there's this one scene where um, someone asks to, um, there's a Latino character and he's, and the, you know, the the boss character says, what should I call you? He says, call me Mexican. He says, that just doesn't feel right. Um, so there's this idea that like calling people immigrant is kind of a slur. Mm. So you want to call them something nicer. So you call them a worker. Mm. And that says a lot about, you know, the country that we live in. The best thing you can be is a worker, right? Yeah, but you definitely don't want to be an immigrant. I think it says so much about me as a person and my ethics and my the life that I've lived to to be an immigrant, but not a worker. I mean, that says nothing about me. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I think, um, well, based on my own experiences in the kind of UK context, there's a preference over the use of migrant rather than immigrant, um, because immigrant is often coupled with illegal. Um, so, so you'll be called an illegal immigrant in the kind of right wing press um, and then the kind of migrants rights left wing uh, movement yeah tends to use migrant more but yeah it's a kind of a, a small nuance but I think it's interesting how yeah the, the choices of language definitely shows what that person is valuing and what they're what they're looking for in, in someone in order to value them. It is my book, when I say immigrant in my book, is it changed to migrant in the UK version? Oh, that's a good question. I think I use immigrant and migrant interchangeably or mm. sometimes migrant pointedly in my book. Um, but I'm gonna check later. <laughs> yeah, that, that'd be interesting to know. Yeah. Um, Otherwise, yeah. someone's getting fired. <laughs> We've got a couple of questions, so I'm going to take a look at them. Cool, I'm going to read them out. Um, we've got one from Anita. It says, how have you found the response to the book? Who did you hope would read it? And do you think those readers have found your book? Well, as far as the UK, I'm hoping Alex Turner will read it. Um, <laughs> he's watching this right now. Hi, Alex. Um, you know, in America, it's... Um, it's a lot of children of immigrants. Um, it's a lot of children of immigrants. When I was writing this book, I really thought it was gonna be white ladies um, who read, who, you know, who follow Oprah's advice about what to read. <laughs> and, um, and that was in my head, I was in my head. And my editor um, was like, you need to get that out of your head. And and it's it's true because I've never written for an audience, and it's it's ter it's terrible to write for an audience because it's um it's just not good as an artist. Um, and so I wrote, I just wrote what felt good, and I wrote for him. Um, and what the reception was surprised me, which was um, it wasn't a bestseller, although it did well, right? because Latinos in this country don't have a lot of social and cultural capital. You know, we don't have the numbers of book buyers to drive a book to, to a bestseller list. But there were so many 
undocumented youth and so many children of immigrants, not just Latinx, but also, um, you know, Asian American, um, African that bought the book and that really related. Um, and it, it was such a strong, I would say the, the, my biggest audience is children of immigrants who are in their early 20s, late 20s, mid 20s. Um, it's a younger audience than I thought. Um, and it's like a, a browner and blacker audience than I thought. Um, somehow the Oprah white ladies are not reading my book. <laughs> it was a surprise to me. How dare they? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there were, I'm going to throw in another of my questions. I'll be using my role as chair. There's um, lots of kind of very darkly witty moments in the book. And I really like the point where you said, I'd honestly rather swallow a razor blade than be expected to change the mind of a xenophobe, which I just thought was perfect. And it really made me think about a book by the British author, Rennie Edo Lodge, which is titled why I'm no longer talking to white people about race, um, which is kind of tongue in cheek, right? It's kind of what you're saying. The people who need to read Rennie's book, um, well, lots of people need to read Rennie's book and your book, but some of the people who need to read them are those white ladies who, who need to learn about racism um, in this country and the US in all its forms. Um, yeah, and I, I kind of draw that connection because of I think there's a sentiment about the overall exhaustion with the, the daily grind of racism and xenophobia. It's, it can get pretty exhausting in my experience as a writer to constantly be thinking about like, how can I make this palatable and how can I make this, you know, change minds and how can I make this speak to people who are reading like right wing tabloids like the Daily Mail as well. And it is interesting to hear that that was in your head initially, but then yeah, you were kind of encouraged to step outside of that and just kind of follow the story that as it was coming to you. Yeah, I mean, to be clear, I'm married to a white lady, but she doesn't expect, she doesn't choose books based on, can this book make me not racist? <laughs> yep. I think that there is a certain segment of the readership that chooses books on, can this change the disposition of my heart? Mm. Can this change the way that I think about people that don't look like me mm. or people that don't choose their sexual partners the way that I do? And books can't do that. They can't. And um, and and I think some sometimes um, sometimes you know it's in the United States. What what happens sometimes is when there are mass shootings um, and they. Um, they target a certain ethnic group. Books about, you know, books written by someone in that ethnic group become bestsellers. Hmm. Because Americans want to consume something by that group, you know. Um, and I find that so troubling. It's like during the highest points of the Black Lives Matter protests, you couldn't buy some of these books by our greatest black authors. And America wasn't suddenly becoming more anti-racist um, or more enlightened. They were just consuming. Mm. They were consuming and they were performing. Mm. Um, same thing happened when there was, um, you know, targeting and mass shootings of Asian immigrants and Asian Americans. Um, it's perverse. And I believe these books should be bought and bought out. Um, but why does it happen when our people are being murdered? Um, and so I, I find that that is very much tied to, you know, can this book change my mind, which is why I don't even try. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I'm gonna share another question um, in the chat, which says, how can we avoid and challenge the stereotype of the deserving immigrant or migrant? You know, I think it's hard because, you know, um, I, I will say, you know, when there's a crime and there's, there, there, there's a report of a violent crime, the first thing I think of is please let it not be, you know, a migrant. Please let it not be a migrant. Because um, 
because I, I know what it's going to look like. I, and, and if it, you know, if it is, I'm like, could you, why couldn't you have behaved? Yeah. Like, it harder for all know. of that. <laughs> you know, um, I know that that is what some of my black friends feel when you are the person who is supposed to represent your entire race, your entire citizenship status, your entire ethnic group. Um, that's a lot, you know? And I think, um, so just to sort of think about it in that way, like if you or your brother or your brother-in-law, if your mistakes, if your worst moment, if your character was used as the barometer for your entire community, your entire family, your entire race, and based on that person's actions or that person's behavior one day um, or their worst moment, if whether you have rights to see your children, to drive a car, to be able to see a doctor, like how insane that would make you. Like that is what you should think about when you think about like, of course it's great to see in the news that, you know, if someone came in as a refugee and now they're getting a PhD, you know, like that's good news objectively. But if you start to see that you're hungering to get the, to, for those kinds of accomplishments when you think of refugees or you're hungering for those kind of accomplishments when you see a brown person, when you see a black person, um, just, just think about that. Just think, why do I require that level of, um, you know, that level of, of, of just rarity? Because that happens so rarely among any of us. In order to, to, to believe that somebody deserves what I have, you know, why, why does that person need to? achieve so much more, be so much more, um, be so so grand in order to have what everyone else has just at the basic level. Um, and just, you know, just, it is really mad crazy to think um, that people have to, you know, catch children falling from windows in their hands in order to have the rights of citizenship. Um, and that is, I think, something that's in the back of migrants' minds all the time, which is like, you do have to sort of be a superhuman in order to just have basic rights. Yeah, you have to do, it's that whole kind of working twice as hard to do half as well and yeah, having to go above and beyond because the bar for you is so much higher. Um, I feel like part of it is that kind of symbolic annihilation of not, not seeing yourself represented anywhere really positively in a, in a significant way whether it's in you know art or media or the news when you do get these crumbs people kind of hang on to them and think like oh this is this is it this is everything this is like you know in the wake of the George Floyd protests I had people DMing me saying like you know what the what the black people need or blah 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 and I'm like I, I can't I can tell you what this black person needs but I can't like speak for you know dismantling capitalism probably but I mean it's yeah that's the outcome of that isn't it not not having those meaningful representations and and uh yeah existing in that way something I tell people all the time is um you know you've probably seen the images in America of the children covered in aluminum blankets and the detention centers at the border that seems to really capture people's imaginations, but that is not the only aspect of migration. That's like a very um, visually engaging um, image. Um, but those children, um, if they're released, they are released to probably undocumented family members, might become undocumented themselves. Those children grow into teenagers. They turn 18, they become, you know, they, they enter our neighborhoods. And people need to check in on those people because those people become their neighbors. They need to not just worry about them when they're covered in the aluminum blankets, right? And um, so sometimes people ask me like, what can I do about the border crisis? And I'm like, the border crisis is in your neighborhood too. It's yeah. like the people who work in your grocery stores and in your restaurants and 
and like you can you can address the border crisis by tipping well like you pro you can always tip better probably i mean if you're in the financial position to do so you can do that um and people just really want to like do something about the border and i'm like think about your your impetus for like flying out to do that and not you know knowing the names of who makes your breakfast sandwiches or making sure you tip at least 20 percent um it was sort of like the thing during um george floyd's murder where people were checking in on black friends that weren't their friends it's like you just want to be a part of this this moment mm. but have you revealed your salary and what you make to your black coworkers who probably don't make as much as you do because that would be helpful in general, right? That addresses systemic issues, um, but it probably won't make you feel as much of a protagonist in this moment. Um, so that's what I would say to people, like when you read books like these, don't just think of the like, the way in which you can be a protagonist in these very sexy, sad stories. Just think about like, like the way this plays out in your life in really boring ways. There's probably something you can do in a very boring ways that nobody will know about. Yeah, that's the whole thing, isn't it? The optics on like those everyday acts of solidarity just aren't as as exciting as like yeah, whether it's flying to the to the border or flying to you know Calais, which is a big um, not so big anymore, a camp um, in northern France where people would sometimes kind of go and volunteer like it was a festival that they could just go hang out at. Um, a lot of people did go and work there in very meaningful ways, but yeah, that was a bit of a tension. And as you say, those more everyday acts of, you know, checking in on your neighbors and can you help them write letters to the school so their kids can get free school meals if they are undocumented and those types of things just aren't as a, yeah, as you say, exciting. You don't become the kind of savior protagonist in that story in the same way, but they're incredibly important. Um, okay, we've got some more questions. Another one is, um, do you read poetry? And if so, which poetry inspires you? Um, you know, I really like, um, songwriting is very important to me. Um, I do read poetry. I am a big fan of Eileen Miles. Um, Eileen Miles uh, graciously and shockingly uh, blurbed my book mm -hmm. after I adored them for many years. Um, you know, Eileen Miles is one of those uh, writers who I can't read them without putting the book down and wanting to write myself. Um, and I feel that way about um, I feel that way about Robert Lowell's poetry. Um, I feel that way um, about Alex Turner's songwriting. <laughs> um, I, you know, I heard that said about um, the Pixies, which was in reference to something that was said about the Velvet Underground, um, which I think is a way that a lot of young people feel about my writing, which is that you can't, you can't hear it like, like not huge best-selling stuff but you, you can't hear it without wanting to start your own band. Mm. Like you can't listen to the Pixies or the Velvet Underground without wanting to start your own band. I can't read Eileen Miles without wanting to write myself. Like it just, it's just the sensation I have. And I think a lot of um, young people who read my book, they, they're like, I think I can write too. Like, I think I want to write too. Um, and so I think there's like the overlap across all of that um, is, um, or, you know, when I listen to The Art of Monkeys, I text my agent and I'm like, what's the writer equivalent of playing at Glastonbury? Um, and I think the, 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 the thing all of that has in common is a certain rhythm to the sentences or a certain rhythm to the words. Um, and I really like that. Mm. So funny serendipity, I saw a guy wearing an Arctic Mon Monkeys t-shirt today walking down the road, which is not a usual sign. So <laughs> I, li I like that you also mentioned them too. Um, yeah, there's something great about reading or, or just consuming a piece of art that makes you think I can do it too. Um, yeah. I think a lot of the feedback I've got on my book is people saying, oh, it's really accessible. 
and initially I was like, mm, is this coded? Are they saying that it's like basic or like, I don't know, but I've chosen to interpret that as meaning that like, yeah, it's, it's something that people can understand and digest and go and share those ideas and talk about. And that's surely a brilliant thing if you're writing to kind of communicate. That's, that's surely the whole point. I so I, you know, when my book was originally, um, in libraries, it was cataloged in either adult or in young adult. Mm. And I was like, how can this be young adult? Are they, are they doing that because I'm brown? Mm. And then I was like, um, when I read that about the Pixies, I was like, no, that makes sense because what the Beatles is, is accessible, right? Like when people listen to the Beatles, they're like, or Nirvana, they're like, this is, these are three chords. Yeah. Like, let me start my own band. Yeah. Because it's brilliant and because you're like, this is, this is, um, it's, um, I mean, it's hard to describe. It's like, it's so much a person's authentic self um, where with, with, where it doesn't seem like it was made by a committee, yeah. you know? Um, and I think, uh, and, and you're, and you can sort of see the way that, that a person's brain works. And, um, and I, and I love that. I think I love when I can sort of break apart a clock and see how it works, not in real life. I, I would not do that <laughs> but like in terms of art. And like, I've met Eileen Miles and Eileen talks the way that they write. Mm -hmm. um, and I've lied on Instagram about going on tour with Alex Turner and I'm sure Alex talks the way that he writes. <laughs> I'm sure you do as well. Um, great. Well, maybe we'll round off with a last question um, from Lighthouse Books. That feels like a fair way to end things as, as they've brought us together. Um, the form of the book is so playful and provocative and pushes the boundaries of reportage, which you and Leah talked about. I wonder if you had pushback from your publisher about how you chose to tell these stories, your stories, and how you handled that. Okay, well, before this started, Leah and I were talking about how I used to badmouth people. <laughs> but now I've grown and changed. Um, why do I want to answer this question? Um, yeah, obviously. Like, um, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, here's the thing. When you want to do something that you believe in, you are probably going to have to bet on yourself. Um, when I was writing this book, I thought that nobody was going to read it. I thought that nobody was going to review it. Um, I, I was working with, with a, another publisher initially um, where I got feedback that gave me reason to believe it was not going to be marketed at all um, and that it was not, people, they didn't think it was good. And so I was like, this is, these are my standards. This is my vision. This is what I want. Um, I have nothing to lose. This is sort of going to be my project. And um, I wasn't writing for an audience. At that point, I wasn't writing for an editor. It was purely my vision. And, you know, by the time I worked with my editor now, um, who's a fantastic editor and who is a thought partner in many ways, um, my vision was concrete. What I wanted to do with representation, what I wanted to do with magical realism, what I wanted to do with my voice was all there. And um, I wrote until, you know, almost until it went to press. Like it went through so many changes um, and I didn't hit the right note until the very end. But, you know, he pushed back on some parts like the magical realism stuff, the, the scene with the squirrel and the basement. He didn't like that. Wow. But I felt strongly about that. And there are some times where ultimately the author has the ultimate power to veto something. Um, but I didn't want to use that power recklessly because he's smart and he knows what he's doing. But sometimes you have to trust your own vision and you have to be really careful about when you trust yourself too, right? So um, what I tend to do in a document when I get edited is I don't look at the edits. I click accept all 
and then I read back the document. And if mm. I see something jumps out at me as being like inherently missing or lacking something or being different, because I, I've drafted it so many times that like, if it jumps out at me, I, I know what's missing. I know what it needs. I know what I need to put back in or take out. Um, and and that's what I that's what I do with each draft. Um, I assume the editor knows what it's what it's doing, um, so it's not ego getting in my way and of me being like this edit, this edit, this edit. Um, I assume they know what they're doing, and then I read back the text where it's just clean without me knowing what they what they said, and then I just do what the text asks me to do, um, and. In this case, you know, the tech, the book asked me to make certain choices and I made those choices. That's such a useful technique. I never would have thought to do that, to just, yeah, accept all those edits and then just read it and feel it and, and think about whether it kind of makes sense as you're reading it. I'm definitely gonna use that myself. It removes ego from the equation because as a writer, I think you can be super humble but you're gonna be stung by any edit i think yeah. um at first i would get edits um and i'd like throw myself on the sofa and i would be like i cannot believe her <laughs> you know um but then i was like i'm just gonna assume good faith on everybody's part and then just ask and then ask what does the text require me to do um and then you're both making <laughs> both you and the editor at the service of the text. Mm. And I suppose that's why it's so important to work with an editor that you do really trust and you respect and you fully believe that they understand your vision and the story that you're trying to tell because then you can kind of put the text in their hands to an extent and, and kind of trust what they're doing with it as well. Yes, so I, the places that I write for um, consistently, the New York Times, uh, that or I have at the New Yorker, their long-term relationships. Um, the um, my editor Chris Jackson. Um, aside from this book, we're signed on for two other books. Also, every piece that I write, I talk him through. I don't give it to him before I publish it for any approval, um, and I don't, as a rule, share anything that I publish as a draft with anybody for approval, um, like no publicist, no agent ever. Um, but I talk my ideas through with him um, because I trust him. I think the most important thing as a writer you can do is develop a solid relationship with, with an editor. Um, and like an editor, I just have always believed in this, that sacred relationship. Um, it, like having it they're they're a partner with you they're a partner with you um and if it is somebody new um then it's 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 just an entirely an editor is, it should be like a marriage you know mm. it's mutual trust it's mutual respect um it's mutual you're, you're on a journey of growth together um so i would just you know it's it's um it's great and it's rare and I'm very lucky to have long term relationships with editors. Mm, definitely, I think as a as a Gemini personally, I find feedback very difficult. So it has to be, yeah it has to be coming from someone whose opinion I respect. Ultimately, otherwise I'm just going to be like, well, guess you hate me and guess I'm a terrible writer and I guess <laughs> I just won't write this piece and it's over and it gets very dramatic so uh, I guess you don't think I'm a genius I happen to disagree <laughs> exactly um well on that perfect note of being geniuses um we will call it to an end um thank you so much Carla for joining us and for sharing your wonderful book which I think there's a button underneath my face or your face or both of our faces where you can buy the book um and obviously I'm sure you can get it from Lighthouse Books uh, directly in store online in different ways. Um, and I believe that there's gonna be a recording of this talk um, on their website with the captions as well afterwards. So if you wanna share that with anybody, um, please do. Otherwise, yeah, that's all from me. Did you have any final things you wanted to share, Carla? 
No, I'm excited to buy your book. I'm going to do it now. Thanks. Oh, so much. thanks. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Oh, thanks. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Thanks, everyone, for joining.